Thank you, Janice. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to open them to the book of Psalms, specifically Psalm 8. This morning we're beginning a brand new sermon series for the next four weeks, looking at not praise and worship in Psalms, but prayer in Psalms. And actually the two go together. One complements the other, like soup and sandwiches. Psalm 8, the words of David, a man after God's own heart, to the people of his day. The words of David, a man after God's own heart, to you and I this morning. The Bible is fresh and it's relevant. Always speaks to each generation as if it's speaking for the very first time. Psalm 8, beginning with verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, I ask myself the question, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly things, crowned him with glory and honor, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, all beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. And then he comes back and says the same thing he said in verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. In all the earth. There's 150 psalms. And when you think about those 150, when you read about them, when you talk about them, I think it would be a consensus here that most of the time it would concern praise and worship. That the psalms are primarily... God's way of teaching us about how to praise Him and worship Him, even on occasions like this. But I'd like to submit to you that Psalms is more than just praise and worship, though that might be the primary purpose. I'd like to submit to you that Psalms is also about prayer. In fact, you might say that's the secondary purpose. Ambrose was an early church father, and he called the book of Psalms a primer on prayer. That from the praise of God in all the situations of life, we can learn how to pray to God in all the situations and circumstances of life. Because Psalms are where the rubber meets the road of life. The psalmist sometimes talks to us about the thrill of victory. Other times he talks to us about the agony of defeat. Sometimes he talks to us about being on a mountain and shouting. Sometimes he talks to us about being in the valley and crying. And all the places that are in between those things. So just as we're to praise God in every situation and circumstance, we're to pray to God in every situation and circumstance. In Psalm 8, David is going to try to reason in his own mind and heart, where is the balance between an omnipotent God who's almighty and an impotent man that is so small and insignificant? How can you close the gap between a God that's so high you can't get over him and you and I that are so low, you can't get under us. You ever thought about that? 
the high God and the low man. How can you reconcile these two? Two things I want to lay on your heart from Psalm 8. First of all, this God on high is a God who is majestic. He is above everyone and everything. If there is a pinnacle in height, he is at the pinnacle. So let's look at verses 1 through 3 and then back to verse 9. God is majestic above all. David says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established or anointed strength because of your foes. You quiet the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place. And then he goes back to verse 9. Now you might be thinking, David had a stuttering problem. No, he didn't. You say, yes, he did. He said the same thing twice. No, he's just re-emphasizing it for us. Verse 9, a mirror of verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I've said it many times, but I'll say it again, because some of you have forgotten it by now. God does not ask us to name him. God does not say, go get yourself educated, come up with a name for me. Go do some investigative work, come up with a name for me. Go talk to someone, come up with a name for me. God does not entrust who he is to us. God tells us who he is. Over and over and over again in the 66 books of the Bible, God is repeatedly telling us, this is who I am. God wants us to know who he is. He wants us to know accurately, correctly, truthfully, so he tells us who he is. That in knowing who he is, we would want to know him. Now, I want you to look at verse 1 and verse 9. I want you to see that both of them begin with, O Lord. O Lord, our Lord. Now, in English, they appear to be the same word. But in the original language, they're not the same word. They both are speaking of the Lord, but both are talking about Him in different ways. In other words, God is educating us about who He is. In verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, the word for Lord is Yahweh. La Yahweh is the name that God gives himself that says, I am a self-existent God. I don't need anyone. I don't need anything. I have no needs that I cannot fulfill for myself. I have no desires that I cannot fulfill for myself. I have no dreams that I cannot fulfill for myself. I am God. I am Yahweh God. I am self-existence. I don't need anyone. I don't need anything. I stand alone. And when you talk about Yahweh God, you're talking about the fact that He is omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipotent. He can do everything. He's omnipresent. He sits on a throne in heaven, but there's no place he's not. He's holy, pure, and perfect to 100% degree. He's timeless. He's past. He's present. He's future. He's eternal. He's unchangeable. The God of yesterday is the God of today. He'll be the God of tomorrow. He's Yahweh God. And Yahweh God, this self-existent God, who's omni-everything. Omni means 100% of everything. 
He's the God of creation. Do you notice in verse 3, David makes reference to the work of his fingers. He's the God of creation. Yahweh God created everyone and everything. If we could see everything above us, He created it all. He set the sun in place and then He lit it. He placed the planets in place. He put them in order as He wanted them to be. He scattered the stars. He flung the comets. He hung the moon. Everything that's above us, Yahweh God created. He not only created everything above us, He created everything around us. He took His hand and He scooped out the valleys. And then He took the dirt and stacked it up and made the mountains. He planted the forests. He filled the oceans with water. He sanded the desert. Everything that's around us in this world, He created. And then he made the pinnacle of his creation. Yes, he made everything above us. Yes, he made everything around us. But you know what the pinnacle of his creation was? It wasn't plants. It wasn't animals. It wasn't things in space or things on earth. The pinnacle of his creation was you. It was me. It was mankind. We are the crown jewel of His creation. And He made us in His image. God created you and I in His own image. Now, there's many different thoughts about what that image means. I believe it means that as He is a triune God, we're a triune people. Think about it. God is one God, but He's three persons in that Godhead. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Holy Spirit. One plus one plus one equals one. You say, I can't figure it out. You don't need to figure it out. Try to figure it out, you'll go crazy, but if you deny it, you'll go to hell. Some things you just accept by faith. The just shall walk by faith, not by understanding. God is three persons, but one God. When He made us, He made us in His image. We are three parts, but one person. We have a physical part we call our body. We have a mental, emotional, volitional part that we call our soul. And then we have a spiritual part that we call our spirit. God gave us all three parts. He only gave the plants one part. That's the physical. He only gave the animals two parts. He made them physical, and they also have minds and hearts, and they make choices. But there was only one creation that God made like Himself. Three parts, but one person. He gave us a body that we could know the world under us. He gave us a mind, a heart, the ability to make choices that we can understand the world around us. But nobody else he created. He gave a spirit to who can know the God of heaven. The God above us. So God made us in his image. He is proud of us. We're the crown jewel of his creation. Made just like him. But there's a problem. This God that is so high. We can't reach Him. We cannot go where He is. We cannot. Yahweh God is unaccessible. He's unreachable. He's unknowable. You got that? And that's who David talks about in the beginning. Yahweh God. Self-sufficient, almighty God in every way, shape, or form. 
so high that we can't reach Him. We cannot engage Him. We cannot be connected to Him. We can have no relationship with Him. All we can know is He created everything and everyone and created us. And that's it. So notice in verse 9, God reveals to us another part of who He is. O Lord, our Lord. In verse 1, that is Yahweh translated. In verse 9, it's Adonai. Adonai literally means involved God. Yahweh God does not involve himself with us other than creating us. Adonai God, he comes to us. He leaves the heights of heaven and he comes to the depths of this world. Not to be our creator, but to be our redeemer. He wants a closeness with us. He wants a connectedness with us. He wants to be engaged with us. Adonai God does not just create us and leave us alone. Adonai God comes to us. He tells us He loves us. He shows us His love on a cross at Calvary. He prepares a place for you and I when we leave this world that we can go to His world. Adonai God is God Almighty too, but He's approachable. He's accessible. We can have a relationship with Him. You say, Pastor, I'm thoroughly confused. He's Yahweh God? Yes. But He's Adonai God. He's Adonai God? Yes, but He's also Yahweh God. He's the God of creation and He's the God of redemption. He's both to you and I as we will let Him be. When David thought of God, he was overwhelmed by the glory of Yahoo God. But he was also overwhelmed by the grace of Adonai God. Yahweh God sits on a throne. Adonai God will hang on a cross. Yahweh God needs nothing from us. Adonai God chooses to want us to be his sons and daughters and to love us and give our lives meaning and purpose and a place with him in one day in heaven. You see, David understood that. That this God who's so high didn't tell us to come to him. He came to us. And this one who created us with plan and purpose saves us with plan and purpose. And he'll save you and he'll save me if we want to call upon the name of the Lord. You know, some people like to argue about theology and who's the elect and who's the predestined and who's this and who's that. Listen, I'm not smart. All I know is this. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you call upon the name of the Lord believing that He is Adonai God, that He wants to have a relationship with you and that relationship will come through a cross at Calvary, through His only beloved begotten Son. He'll save you. And when He saves you, He'll change you. He'll do a sanctifying work in you that will make you like Him. You're predestined for that to happen and then you'll go join Him in heaven one day. So David starts out quickly by saying, Yahweh God, Adonai God, thank you for revealing yourself to me. I don't understand it all, but thank you. I like to read biographies, and several months ago I was reading a biography. Actually, it was by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, but it also had other stories in it.
that they told and were referenced into it from other astronauts like Frank Borman or John Glenn who preceded our, them or came before them. And it was interesting, I don't know the faith of the astronauts, where they're at on the journey of faith. I believe some of them are believers by the way they spoke in the book. I think others of them probably not. But every one of them said that when they got up in that spaceship and they were circling the earth and they were looking down at our planet from above, when they landed on the moon and they got a chance to stand on the moon and walk on the moon and look back at our world, every one of them, whether they were a person of faith or no faith, they gave us an astronaut word for what they saw. Wow! <laughs> wow! Evolution couldn't have done that. A big bang explosion couldn't have done that. Aliens couldn't have done that. Only a creator God in heaven could have ever done that. Amen. And they spoke of that as they looked down and saw the creative work of Yahweh God. And we should be wowed when we stand back and see the saving work of Adonai God. Because when I look at you, I go, wow, <laughs> he saved you? <laughs> and then you look up here at me and say, wow, God saved him. We're all miracles of grace. Secondly, not only is God majestic, but secondly, we matter to God. This God that's so high so above us, who chooses to have a relationship with us, we matter to him. You see, you're right here looking at me and you say, Pastor God doesn't even know who I am. Yes, he does. He knows who you are. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're thinking, knows what you're feeling, knows what you're doing, knows what you've done, knows what you will do. And he still loves you. Look at verses 4 through 8. David says the question after talking about Yahweh God and then concluding with Adonai God. He says, what is man? He's asking a question of himself, of you and me. He says, what are we? That he would even think about us. For he's mindful of him. That the Son of Man would even care for us. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You, Lord, crowned him with glory and honor. He's speaking of man. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. The sheep, the oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Lord, you have blessed man. You've given him back dominion over all that was taken from him. It's interesting that the word for man in verse 4 has an idea behind it that says man is two things. This word used for man suggests that you and I who are people, we are men, we are women, we are frail and we are fleeting. This word for man speaks of our frailty and our fleetingness. What does it mean to be frail as a person? It means not that we're physically weak, physically bent over, physically without strength. It could include that, but that's not the emphasis of the frailty. We are frail spiritually. That's what David says. When God looks at us, he sees a frail people spiritually. We are crooked. We're corrupt. We have no righteousness in us. None of us do. And yet God has an interest in us. We're fleeting. Our lives are temporary. Even if you live to be 103 years old, that's just a drop in the bucket of eternity. 
The Bible says we're but a puff of smoke, but a vapor. That's true. We're here. You see us for a moment. We're gone. And the brevity of life as you get older gets faster. See, y'all don't know nothing about that. All I can say is, is like this. When your little Christmas comes, long, long, long wait. When you get big in your pain for Christmas, it's every day. We know that the same distance to Christmas is every year. But that's what David's talking about. Man is, is, is fragile spiritually. His life is but temporary. It's rapidly going away. And yet God, in our sinfulness, in our short-livedness, God chooses to love us. He chooses to save us. He chooses to prepare a place for us in eternity. God chooses to do that. Psalm 139, verse 17 and 18 the psalmist says that we are on the mind of God. Pastor, what is God thinking about? He's thinking about you and me. How precious of me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of all of your thoughts. If I could count them, they're more than the sand. That's how much, Lord, you think of me. Wow. The prophet Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 17, the book that bears his name, says, the Lord God is with us. He is mighty to save. He takes great delight in us. He quicks us with his love. He rejoices over us in his song. Not only are we on the mind of God, God sings songs about us. God sings about us. I didn't know God could sing. But he sings when he thinks of you and I. We're on his mind. We're in his mouth. We're in his songs. We're in his heart. Isaiah 65, 19. We bring the Lord joy. Where does joy come from? It comes from the heart. This is amazing. This Yahweh God that created everyone and everything. This Adonai God that redeems whosoever calls upon his name. This God. Thinks about us, loves us, and sings songs about us. This glorious God of creation, this gracious God of salvation, says through David, I'm going to give you back everything that was taken from you. I'm not just your God of creation. I'm not just your God of redemption. I'm going to be your God of restoration. When God created Adam and Eve, he gave them dominion over this world. Adam was king, Eve was queen. And they had dominion over everyone and everything in this world. It was their world to govern. You know the story, Satan came disguised as a serpent. Using deception, he took dominion from Adam and Eve. When he duped them into sinning, with that sin, they lost their reign. They were overthrown from their rule. No longer would they be royalty. They now would be peasants. No longer would they rule over what God gave them. They would be ruled over by Satan himself. That's why when Jesus came, he was called the second Adam. Not only did he come back to save, he came back to take back the dominion of this world from the God of this world, which is the devil. So while Satan has this world right now, it's not his world. He's a squatter. And one day he's going to be booted out. As God takes it back and gives it to you and I in the kingdom that's going to come. Adam lost it, Jesus regained it, and he's going to give it back to us. That's what David's talking about there when he says, we're going to have 
dominion over the works of our hands and His hands. I wouldn't want this world as it is right now. If you said, Pastor, would you become President of the United States? I'd say no. Why do I want to step down? I've already got the best job you can have. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be co-rulers with Christ Jesus of a kingdom that's His. That's how much He thinks of us. He's going to consult me as He governs this world. He's going to consult you. We're going to be co-rulers with Him. And this will be a world of peace. There won't be any more war in His world. The spears will become plowshares. It'll become a world of meekness. The lion and the lamb, they'll lie down together. And the lamb won't end up inside the lion's belly when they lay down together. They'll get along. Be a world of prosperity. There'll be no hunger. There'll be no nakedness. There'll be no homelessness. There'll be no sickness. There'll be no ignorance. It'll be a world of prosperity that God has for His people. We'll rule over that. It'll be a world of happiness. There'll be no more pain in God's world. No more tears to come to the face of people. The things of this life will be no more. Paradise will come back. And you and I will have a chance to rule with the Lord over it. Now, some of you are thinking as time is running out. Pastor, you said you were going to talk about prayer, but you ain't mentioned it. I know. Now I am. You say, are you going to have enough time? Yes, I will. You'll get out by 3 o'clock, I promise you. Why is it important that we know who God is? So we can pray to Him properly. What have you learned today? If nothing else, you've learned that God is Yahweh. He's the Creator. You are His creation. You are created in His image. You didn't come from the goo to the zoo to become you. You're not a piece of protoplasm that has just developed into something that looks like you are now. You're not some monkey's uncle. You're not some space alien's lunch. You are a creation of God with a plan and a purpose by that creator God to live your life and make a difference. You also have been saved by redeeming God. And when He saved you, He gave you a plan and a purpose with that salvation. That you could evangelize the lost and you could edify the saints and do so within the local church. God above us, God with us, is now God in us. And so as we close... I want you to remember what you heard today because you're going to go to prayer. And I want you to remember who He is, who you're praying to. This is a Yahweh God who spoke everything into creation. He didn't even dirty His hands. He didn't even lift a finger. He just spoke. And things happened. And that God, Yahweh, so powerful, reached down and saved my soul and became my Adonai, God. Doesn't that get you excited then to pray? You created me, Lord. You saved me, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for me. Now, Lord, I have some things to ask you to do for others. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.